I think there were several of us who saw, hey, we have romance roots, but we still love the mystery. We still love the suspense. We still love wartime books or we still love, you know, spy novels. And so the way I felt about it was that the attraction heightens both elements of the story because you're never more afraid than when someone you care about is in danger. That was the voice of Sandra Brown. Welcome, everyone, to Fate of Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I read romance novels and I write them. I'm Jennifer Prokop. I am a romance reader and editor. And this week, for our first Trailblazer episode of season four, we are absolutely beyond thrilled to have had a conversation with absolute fucking legend as Tom Hardy would say, (laughs) Sandra Brown. Yeah, we recorded with Sandra uh, in August, I think. That sounds right. And we will be talking with her today about her life in romance, about her new novel, Blind Tiger, about her many, many, many New York Times bestsellers, and just about all the amazing history and stories she has. Um, as a romance uh, writer and how she started in the business and where she is now. I think that was the best part of the conversation, this sense that we were talking to somebody who knew everything, (laughs) who had been there from the start and really had a lot to say about how the genre has grown and um, where the genre was and where it could be. So without further ado, here is our interview with Sandra Brown and... um, I don't know, enjoy it as much as we did, everyone. Um, Well, we are thrilled to have with us Sandra Brown. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you very much, Sarah and Jen. I've looked forward to this. Well, we are, we're super excited about Blind Tiger, which is, did I see correctly on your Instagram? It is your 73rd New York (laughs) Times bestseller. As of of, uh, yesterday, I found out that it will be on the uh, Times list a week from Sunday, but we find out like 10 days before, as you know. And uh, so, yeah, like last night, we had a little celebration here because it's uh, officially my 73rd New York Times bestseller. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, that living the dream. <laughs> well, thank you. I've, I've been very fortunate. And all the people that I've worked with and uh, my fans have followed me from, you know, one genre to another, one type of book to another, shorter books to longer books. And Blind Tiger was the longest book I've ever written. Oh, so, interesting. Uh, yeah. So it, and in itself, it was so different because I kind of switched, you know, time periods. I went back a hundred years. <laughs> so uh, it, that was a, kind of a, you know, leap of faith and a, a trust that my readers would follow me. And so I'm pleased to say so far, it looks like as though they are. So what was it like to go back and do research for a historical, again, especially in 1920, which is, you know, you've never, I mean, you wrote historical historicals in romance, but to have 1920 be the year. It was, uh, it was hard, uh, actually, but the reason I did is because when it got time last year uh, to begin my next book, I thought, how do you write a book where people are wearing masks and the news was so bad every night and I hated even watching the evening news because it always left me so depressed and in a bad mood. And I, I thought, you know, I I want some escape. And I figured if I felt that way, that readers would feel that way. So I thought, what was happening 100 years ago? And lo and behold, things were all that different. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so you went back to a different pandemic. Right, a different (laughs) pandemic. There was another women's movement that resulted, thankfully, in suffrage. Uh, Soldiers were coming home from a very unpopular foreign war with post-traumatic stress, but they didn't even know the name of it. Have a name for that, right. At that point in time. And um, as if things are bad enough, nobody could drive by a drink because <laughs> the prohibition <laughs> had gone into effect January 16th of 1920. So then I did, um, I, I just researched what was happening, prohibition in Texas, which is where I live. 
And who knew, but like 50 miles down the road from where I have lived most of my life was a town that was nicknamed the moonshine capital of Texas. Oh. <laughs> and I thought, I thought Perfect. little Glen Rose, you know, had all these body houses and speakeasies and lots of moonshining because geographically it was perfect for it. And, um, So I started doing research on that. And the more I got into it, the more fun I started having. But Jen, you asked me about the research. It was so fun in one way, but in another way, it was very time consuming because I would have to stop and look everything up. You know, it was like, uh, and at one point in time, I said, Laurel, my heroine, uh, floorboarded her Model T. Yeah, well, she yeah. drove a 1915 Model T. So after I'd written that scene and I went back, I thought, better do some deeper research how to drive a Model sure, T. Sure, because someone is going to email you <laughs> right. about this car. About this, yeah. <laughs> and so lo and behold, a Model T 1915 model had three pedals on the floor. One was the clutch on the left. In the middle was reverse. And on the right was the brake. The accelerator was on the steering wheel. So you actually controlled your velocity, your speed by levers on how much, you know, gas you gave it was controlled by a lever on the steering wheel. So I could have made that really terrible mistake had Mm -hmm. I not gone back and checked and that, that out research. again. So I couldn't <laughs> say that she floorboarded it. <laughs> My dad lives in Florida and we went to visit, I think it's like Edison's Florida home. And he, there's a huge collection of Model Ts there. Really? And I, the whole time I was reading this book was really thinking like, I wonder what it would be like if these moonshiners had access to, you know, like a Ford F-150 instead, (laughs) because (laughs) these things, I mean, they really are small. I mean, it's it's really kind of a miraculous to think about. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems so big and fast to them, but, you know, to us. Well, one thing uh, they did, and this was also interesting, Ford would sell the chassis, the main chassis, but people would adapt, like, before they started making pickup trucks per se, people would add beds onto their the Model T and kind of customize them. So customizing your automobile is not a new science um, that we figured out <laughs> this day, uh, this century. They were already doing it. And uh, so they were very innovative even before more uh, Ford started manufacturing all these things. So all of these little facts, you know, came out. And then the, the part about moonshining was really fun um, to research because most of the stories, the tales that people had to tell, I would just laugh out loud because you could be like, you can't make this up. I mean, it was wild. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the speed with which they had their cars to go, that's where NASCAR started was wow. because the moon. That's right. It's where NASCAR came to be because moonshiners would soup up their engines to outrun the cars that lawmen had. And that's where NASCAR was born in the Carolinas, actually. But uh, yeah, so all of this was just fun. You know, it was uh, it was a, a fun departure. And I think from a creative standpoint, uh, it's good for writers to try something different, to uh, go at a different pace. Um, I've always, throughout my career, just spanned 40 years now, uh, but just to try something different to challenge myself. And I think um, the, the worst thing that a writer can do is become complacent and and uh just rely on you know their history um in the marketplace because the, the market is constantly changing it's a you know it's a it's a evolution every day and um it's a learning curve every day so in order to keep up uh and to to remain vital in the marketplace, I think it's good for writers to challenge themselves. Say, I never tried this, you know, wonder if I can do that. And at the same time, maintain the expectations of their readers, you know. So I think Blind Tiger, yes, it's set in another century and um, and yes, had to do a lot of research on historical facts, but the bottom line is it still has, I, I believe, 
the trademarks of a Sandra Brown novel, that when one opens it and starts reading, they they more or less know that it's still a Sandra Brown novel. Oh, a thousand percent. We were talking about that before um, the interview that we just... I mean, it just, I felt like I just fell right into it, to the Sandra Brown world. Um, One of the things that I think is really interesting about this, and you've obviously been writing, you've written historicals before. This is not your first historical. Um, People who listen to Fate of Mates know that. And um, one of the things that, that I think about a lot as a historical writer is we tend to be judged. There's often a sense in the world that, oh, well, when you're writing historicals, you're just writing, you're closing the door on current day and just writing the past. And I mean, we know that's not true. And one of the things that really echoed for me in this book was how current it felt in the sense of, as you said, a hero coming home from war, the Spanish flu, these kind of large scale things that felt so, it's almost impossible to read the the pieces where, because Thatcher, our hero, has had the Spanish flu. Um, and it's impossible to read that without thinking, oh my gosh, we're, yeah. we're doing that now. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how, mo- how modern the book is too, in that, in that sense. How are you thinking about the world that way? Yeah, well, thank you for that. But that's how I made my pitch <laughs> to the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, it I said, guess what? Uh, I want to do a historical, you know, and it kind of took him aback. And because uh, he's only edited uh, my contemporary, you know, thrillers or suspense novels. And um, he said, well, like, where to? <laughs> where are you going? <laughs> right. And so what are you I doing, started, Sandra? <laughs> I started drawing for him all of the parallels that we've talked about. And I said, and when you really get down to it, I said, uh, Shakespeare would have made the same pitch to his editors because <laughs> the human condition does not change. It hasn't for millennia, you know, and so when you when you start talking about human emotions they're all still there greed lust jealousy rage you know sorrow grief all of these things are still identifiable by every human being and so i think if you if you tell a story correctly and if you if you reveal to your characters um the the emotions, uh, uh, you know, to your readers, the emotions of the characters, then they're going to relate to that. Because if you have, some, if you lose someone dear to you, beloved to you, you're going to feel the same thing that someone did hundreds of years ago. You know, it's it that hasn't changed. The human heart has not changed, and um, and so even though our devices certainly have, uh, and I can't tell you what a relief it was to write a book without everybody <laughs> having a cell phone. <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> because I think technology in some ways has ruined suspense because you can't make people disappear as easily as you sure. used to. Uh, but in answer to your question, uh, Sarah, the the Emotions, the human emotions, um, if you tell a, a story well and you really explore the mind and the heart of your characters, then the story should be relatable no matter where it's at and what time period. And so I wouldn't give too much credence to someone who says, well, you're leaving contemporary life behind because right. when you when you you know strip it all away, we're people and we've been people for a long time <laughs> and we've experienced the same emotions at one point in our lives or another. Okay, so Sarah, my my dad was a soldier in Vietnam. And one of the things Sarah and I have talked about sort of over and over again, and I joke that if I ever got like a PhD in romance, it would be about like the the Vietnam hero returning home, is a lot of your early romances, most of them, featured men who were who were who had been in Vietnam. And Thatcher is a man coming back from World War One. So is is this something that is of like particular interest to you or 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 do you, like me, sometimes think this is just like an American 
I don't know, story. This, I mean, maybe it's a story everywhere, but a particularly American story about like a man coming home from war and not knowing where he fits in. I mean, Thatcher can't even afford to get home. They've taken his uniform from him. Um, And I was really fascinated to think about like that in parallel with some of your early romances. Well, that and that's true. And I have to confess, I guess that's an accidental thing, Jen, because I don't really set out to make any kind of, you know, political statement. That's not my role. Um, I'm a fiction writer. I tell, you know, stories. Um, but it's interesting now that you mentioned it, because I really, really hadn't thought of that. But I suppose because um, the Vietnam War was so you know, part of my development as, uh, you know, when I was in, well, I guess junior high, high school, college, and then early adulthood, um, I knew people that were lost, you know, in that war. And, um, and it was so much of our culture and it was so much of a culture change in, in our country. So I guess in the background of my mind, that was omnipresent, didn't even recognize it. And it's interesting that you should say, because even recent books, um, the, the hero in Thickest Thieves is an ex-soldier. Um, there have been many who have served uh, the character in Lethal, um, mm-hmm. uh, what was his name? Oh dear, uh, Colburn. <laughs> Sorry, with a C. Uh, 73 bestsellers later, you're gonna forget some names, right? <laughs> it's really fine. I, I mean, I don't have a little glitch every now and then. Uh, yeah, and and so that influenced you know his his character and how he was very you know tough and and cold toward the the world and until he meets this little five-year-old girl who totally you know disassembles him and so it's um i think in the back of my mind possibly it's kind of that injured male whether whether the injuries are physical or emotional or mental um it's kind of that you know the beast uh that that by the end of the book is more or less tamed, but there's a reason for the way he that acts. And I think that war and war experiences, you know, uh, play into that in some regard. But I, it's a subconscious thing. I really never had thought about it until you mentioned it. But now that you do, I can see, you <laughs> know, there's a pattern there. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> It's interesting because as I was reading Blind Tiger and knowing we were going to have this conversation, I was thinking a lot about heroes in thrillers and mysteries versus heroes in romance and how that sort of loner archetype really fits both both worlds. And and what you, I think, do so beautifully in all of your books is you— you deliver your loner hero a community in in a lot of ways. And Thatcher, for me, feels like your romance roots kind of delivering delivering these thriller heroes a different kind of happiness at, or at the end, a different kind of satisfaction right. at the end. Yeah. But I also want to talk about your heroines because for me, a Sandra Brown heroine always has a purpose outside of That's the hero. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. That has... I mean, as a writer that has inspired, as a reader that inspired me, as a writer, there is, when I, I said on Twitter the other day that you're one of the reasons why I write romance. And oh, you. and you are, I think your heroines have really kind of imprinted on me in a lot of ways, the DNA of the Sandra Brown heroine of, you know, the heroine who is backed up against the wall. We love a hero, Jen and I oh. love a heroine backed up against a wall. Right. 100%. Who ends up. A bootlegger, because that's of course that's the of avenue, course. and also she's super badass. The minute she learned to drive, I was like, but the whole part where she says to, I mean, there's a part I wish I would have marked it where she says, you know, once she decided this was her task, she was going to be the best at it, and I was like, there is a Sandra that's Brown, Sandra Brown heroine, <laughs> yeah. Well, I I have to admit when I first pitched the book uh, to my editor and I and and it was going to be Thatcher's story. It was going to be his story. But once I started writing it, as my characters typically do, 
they they took over and um it the book actually turned out to be laurel's story because uh beyond not you know he, he changed careers from that of a cowboy um and we see the potential in him early on to ha do more than just go back to the ranch you know and and do that and he would have been happy to do that for the rest of his life but um he didn't make when he when the book is is ended he's more or less the same individual that he was he still thinks the same way he still got that laconic uh cowboy uh nature that code of honor that he lives by you know i'm not gonna look for trouble but you don't mess with me or somebody i care about or you're gonna be in trouble and so we get that early on and we still feel that at the end of the book laurel is the one who has the character arc it became mm -hmm. her book when she said you are teaching me how to drive and her father-in-law starts sputtering and she says today today <laughs> you know we weren't gonna and i thought huh she's kind of taken over this and then i yeah. loved you know all of the things that she does the uh limbs that she goes out on <laughs> so to oh. speak i mean the whole operation being her brainchild the pies and it's the... not just to survive now it's not just to put food on the table it's i'm gonna thrive and if i'm gonna do if i'm gonna be a lawbreaker I'm going to be the best at it. <laughs> and and uh, of course, and, and another element, um, which I believe was one of the questions that, that you were going to ask me, what makes uh, a good romance? And we can get to that. But one of the main elements um, is that they need to be forbidden to each other. And so in every Sandra Brown book that I've ever written, I've tried to make it, if he's a fireman, she's got to be an arsonist. <laughs> or right. um, for whatever reason, this cannot happen. They cannot mm -hmm. possibly get together because they're on opposite sides of something. And in this instance, it was so obvious. You know, when I first started plotting it and i thought okay can i really do that with a heroine can i really do that and yeah yes yes was like <laughs> yes. yes you know hell yes if you're going to write me then i'm going to take over and and she <laughs> did and um and and uh, you know i think every reader i hope every reader male and female will admire her gutsiness you know they might not admire the enterprise but they i think they will admire and can identify with somebody who says okay i've been knocked down yeah. twice really hard um and that doesn't even count her upbringing her parents you know her her domineering father so she's refusing um and resolved never to depend on anyone to take care of her again and i think that is a a lesson in in what contemporary you know women in our society are learning uh is that you know as much as you love somebody um as kind as someone is to you you need to be able because you don't know what fate is going to throw in your path you need to be able to take care, take of, care yourself. of yourself not depend mm -hmm. on other people anyone <laughs> it was a joy to read blind tiger um and to return to to your books um to your historicals i mean i as an as a as an avowed, we did a podcast where I said it out loud as an Another Dawn fan. I was like, here we go. Yeah. A dusty Texas. I'm ready. Yes. Um, so, uh, so funny, a little uh, backstory on that. I wrote uh, Sunset Embrace mm -hmm. and I sent it in to um, my editor at the time. They were published by Bantam. And uh, my editor at the time after you know a month or so had gone by and the book was in production and she called me one day and she said 
the ladies here in the office um, had a request. <laughs> and I thought, you know, signing books for their aunts, you know, their grandmothers, <laughs> their, their moms. And she said, they want you to write another book and, and make Bubba um, the hero. And I went, ah, well, let me see what I can do. And, the ladies uh, in the office always know. <laughs> they know. <laughs> and so I I set out to plot uh, another dawn, and uh, and it was difficult um, because I, I bet. had to age him ten years because in Sons and Embrace it was really kind of a coming of age book for him. So I had to age him 10 years, and I thought, do I really want a hero named Bubba? I think I'm going to have to give him a name. <laughs> and um, so I uh, I did that, and then thinking of, um, you know, the, the plot, and the plot broke my heart, actually, and I think it broke the heart of a lot of readers. Of but lot it of was readers. essential to his and Banner's book you know, uh, the, the plot development there. So anyway, um, thank you for the compliment. And I love those <laughs> books because I love cowboys. I'm from Texas. I'm a sucker right. for cowboys, <laughs> as, Thatcher, <laughs> as Thatcher is, you know. Uh, I loved his bow-legged walk and, mm-hmm. and his cowboy mm-hmm. hat and his spurs and <laughs> all of that. <laughs> Same. Same. Everything. Um, well, I would love to hear your about your journey into romance because you know we've talked on the podcast about how you were really there at the start of Harlequin American with Vivian Stevens. We talked about Tomorrow's Promise on the podcast. So Love Swept. Yeah, the early Love Swept books. So um I wonder if you could sort of give us a sense of paint us a picture of those early years and how you became a romance writer. My first five uh, books were for Vivian Stevens in another house in another line. It was called Ecstasy, and it was published by Bantam Doubleday Dell. And how all of that happened? First of all, I got fired from my job, uh, and I, I was working in television for the ABC affiliate here in Dallas, and um, they came through one day and fired all of us who were on-air contributors to this magazine show. They said well, they needed fresh faces. So God bless my husband, uh, who's still my husband. <laughs> uh, he, he's put up with me all these years. Um, but he, he said, you know, you've always said you want to write fiction. And now you've got time and opportunity, uh, you know, to do it. And I had two babies at home. I mean, I, they were toddlers, my children. And um, I said, gosh, but, you know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. And he said, well, <laughs> you don't, you won't know if you don't try and you can either keep talking about it or you can do it. So I sat down and proceeded to start writing and he had a talk show. This is a long story, but anyway, he had a talk show in the morning. He interviewed all the authors who, who came in on tour. So one was a local woman who wrote romances. Her name was Paris Afton Bonds. And so oh, sure. She um, she volunteered as a favor for him having her on his show to read one of my manuscripts. And she said, you ought to be writing romances. And I was like, what's a what's a romance? I didn't know, you know, one. And she said, well, like a Harlequin romance. And that Harlequin was the only show in town. And they were, of course, a British company. So most of their writers are British. But I went, bought 12 or 15 of them, started reading them. I thought, yeah, I, I think I could do this. So I proceeded to. And Paris invited me to go with her to Houston to a writer's conference. Oh, my gosh. And there I met a woman named Candace Camp. Oh, my God. These are I'm course. like, of course. Who had first published The Rainbow Season, and that was one of the best books I had ever read, and I loved it. And I couldn't speak when I met Candace. I, I, Candy, I called her. I was just like, <gasps> and she wrote that book under a pseudonym, Lisa Gregory. And um, so I met her at that cocktail party. And also at the cocktail party, I met a woman from a small East Texas town who had a bookstore, Mary Lynn Baxter, who later wrote for Silhouette. 
And she said, well, I've read everything ever written. And I have the <laughs> ear of every uh, uh, editor in New York. So when you get a manuscript you like, send it to me and I'll read it. And I'll tell you whether or not it's any good. So about three months later, she had given me her phone number. Three months later, I called her and I said, do you remember meeting me? And, da, 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 and yes, what have you written? And I said, well, I'm going to send you something. And she called me a few days later and said, this is exactly what a woman named Vivian Stevens is looking for, for a new line of romances called Ecstasy. Oh, my gosh. I have shivers. I know. This is the greatest story. Keep going. Do you have five or six hours to stay with us? (laughs) Vivian bought my first book about two weeks later. And then 13 days, uh, she said, do you have another one? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing it up. And she said, well, Cindy, is it same orientation? And I said, yeah, same level of heat. And I said, yeah. So she, I sent it to her and she bought my second book 13 days after the first one. So I saw my first two. And then she bought the next three, and then she moved to Harlequin, and that's when she she bought Tomorrow's Promise. And so by by then, at that point in time, every publisher was developing their own line. Uh, Jove had a line called Second Chance, and uh, I later wrote for for them. Um, Silhouette had a line, um, Pocket had a line called Silhouette, and then Silhouette Desire, and then... What was the other? Anyway, ultimately, I was writing for four different houses under four different names, including my own. The pseudonyms, I'd love to talk a little bit about that because was was it four different houses under four different names because each house wanted a different right, name? Right. And, and okay. uh, my first pseudonym was for Vivian for the ecstasy line. And I used Rachel Bryan because those are my children's names. Oh, okay. And it was a bribe. Uh, if you let mommy work <laughs> and leave me alone, <laughs> That's awesome. we'll go get ice cream and I'll put your name on every page of the book. And so <laughs> that's. <laughs> oh my gosh. Perfect. <laughs> and, for, and then I also thought Rachel Ryan sounded a whole lot more like a romance writer than Sandra Brown. But when I started writing for Carolyn Nichols for the Love Swept line, um, Carolyn wanted to, instead of featuring the series or making the series the selling point, she wanted the authors to be more spotlighted. She wanted the authors to be the prominent name um, and Develop the trademark, of course, but also to really emphasize the individuality of the authors. And so uh, I, she said, I want to use your your real name. And I said, it's about time to, you yeah. know, <laughs> that I did. Um, so that's that's the that's the history. So as we're talking about that question, I mean, I feel you you must know what's coming, but the, <laughs> the love swept line and and them wanting readers to know authors. Can we talk about this, which is that random <laughs> look? Know, yeah. You mentioned that to me. I had forgotten that. I, had- <laughs> I love, first of all, I love that you have forgotten this. <laughs> can imagine being so cool that you forgot that you were your own cover model. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> And we have lots of serious questions, too. And but. <laughs> you said, how did that come about? And honest and truthfully, I cannot remember. I just remember being asked. And I don't think you were alone because I think Nora Roberts was also on one around the same time. I feel like they they did this with a few people. There were a couple people, I think. There was another one. I can't remember the name, though. Beautiful writers. Scott <laughs> got to play models. My, my hair. Has never been that long. <laughs> I was going to say, is this your actual hair? No. And I never could express that gorgeous either. So what I think they did, I think what they did is take our picture in that pose. And then they had, you know, the, the painting done. And it was a really pretty good rendition of it's beautiful. My face, but I didn't have the, the hair. The flowing the locks. <laughs> 
<laughs> and um, we've talked about this on the podcast before, but this is McLean St- Stevenson from MASH, yes. right? Uh-huh. And yeah. did you get to pick, was he a favorite or <laughs> were they just like, sorry, Sandra, you're going to have to He's be He's our local hottie, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who, I don't know how he got selected either. I don't, I <laughs> he his, totally he don't needed remember. the press. He needed to hang out with you. He needed the glow up of Sandra Brown. <laughs> So going back to those kind of early days, because we always think about that as like, it must have felt a little like there was an explosion of popularity because prior to that, it was so historic. You know, we know that in the 70s, it was, you know, big historical times, but this is really the burst of contemporary romance. Yes. And did you, did it feel like it to you? Did you feel like you were on the precipice of something? Yes, in a way, because uh, as I said, all of it, up to that point in time, Harlequin um, published in London and in Toronto, and and they had, I think, the first American author that they bought was Janet Daly, and I could be wrong on that, but I think that's right. And so it was like, well, duh, you've got a whole continent right. <laughs> over here of, of, um, of women writers yet untapped. And, um, and then, so it was, it was like, uh, and the, and the competition among the houses, this is a great time to be starting. I, I've often said that, um, I hit it at exactly the right moment in time um, because it was the competition among the houses to sew up, you know, the Nora Roberts, the Jane Ann Chris, the Barbara Delinsky, the uh, Elizabeth, Sandra Brown. Uh, <laughs> I, could, I could go on and on and on all the writers that, you know, came up um, out of this. And so um it was it was very competitive among the houses to to publish quickly. Well, I wrote like a frenzy all the time. I mean, it, I was going to say, must have been when my kids got old enough to go to um, kindergarten and they were in school because it was like I get to write without. And, and so that I think the year nineteen eighty. Three, I think, which, oh gosh, that sounds so long ago. It was so <laughs> long ago, but um, I think I had 11 books published. Wow. I think wow. that That's... I had one a month except for one month. And, um, and so it was a juggling act. It was like, and each, you know, each line, whether it was Silhouette, um, Love Swept, Second Chance, uh, The American Harlequins, um, whether each line had nuances that were uniquely theirs. There was just Mm -hmm. something, you know, a little bit different. And uh, so I would tailor a story. If I, if I thought of a plot, I would kind of tailor the story. Oh, that would make a good desire. Or, Oh, that would make a good, you know, love sweat. And then there were some um, differences in the length. So if a story was going to be a little bit longer, you know, I would I would tailor it. But it was a kind of a juggling act. And I have to to say uh, one lesson I learned um, early on is I didn't talk about my business with anybody. Um, what I wouldn't share anything that I had spoken about with one editor with another. I kept very Uh close counsel. Um, and, um, and I wound up on speaking terms with everybody with whom I've ever worked. (laughs) And I think one reason (laughs) was because I didn't discuss my business nor anyone else's with, you know, with anyone. So that might be a a word of advice for, (laughs) for a starting author you know, hold your cards close to your best and and concentrate on your business and nobody else. One of the things that's really interesting is you were just talking about how like fertile a time it was for authors. But this is when I, Sarah and I both kind of came up reading at this time. I mean, we were young. It's fine. It doesn't matter. We were barely even born. It doesn't matter. We were... (laughs) Reading romances when we were 10, and I don't, I'm not sad about it. But 
I also think this was an incredibly then fertile time to come up as a romance reader. So can you at all, are there, do you have stories? Do you get letters from fans? These books mean something to people. Yeah. uh, And it's so humbling. It really is. Um, But before (laughs) we had email and, and social media, um, you know, fan letters, I would collect them uh, from the, mailbox. Uh, and, uh, and I would dedicate, you know, like one day a month to answer, you know, by hand, um, all of these letters and it, it took a lot of time, but right now social media takes a lot of time. So, you know, but I was always so touched by the stories that people would tell me about how my story affected them. And to this day, it's, it's really, humbling and, and um, gratifying uh, and validating because I can bang my head against the wall think nobody is going to read this crap. <laughs> you know, this is just, you know, this is just another, uh, you know, trying to get it right. And I struggle with that. I struggle with the insecurity of I'll never write another, you know, sentence again. Uh, every day I do that. But when you get a letter that says this touched me at such a, a needful time in my life, whatever it is, a, an illness, the loss of a partner or child or, you know, something really tragic. And they say, your books just saved me through this. And uh, and that's when it's like, you know, if that one person is the only person who took something from that labor that I put, then it was worth it. You know, it makes those long hours and days at the keyboard really and truly worthwhile. We'll get to the shift, the the way that you moved from romance um, to thrillers, but I'm I'm curious particularly about readers and the separate genres, because it often feels when, you know, when I'm at events or, you know, when Jen is at events, it often feels like people always say, oh, romance is totally different than everyone else. You know, thriller, thriller, the thriller audience isn't like this. It doesn't become as personal. Do you, have you had that experience or because you're sort of still Sandra Brown and the books <laughs> still feel Sandra Brownie, do you still get the the feedback. Uh, so the sometimes feedback. from from really dumb people, <laughs> uh, and I, you know, I, if someone says, "Well, I don't read those kinds of books," and I said, "Well, have you ever read one?" No. Well, then how do you know what kind it is? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know, and but I, I, I'm, I'm more, um, I'm less sensitive to it than I once was because yeah. um, then in the same breath, they'll say, gosh, but it must be really, you know, how do you write a book? And I'll go, yeah, that's, that's kind of tricky. You know, if it were <laughs> easy, everybody would be doing it because the writer's yeah. life is a great yeah. life, yeah. you know? So um, I, I, I kind of dismiss that anymore, you know, and um uh, but because I know how hard it is and uh, my husband knows how hard it is and my children and grandchildren know how hard yeah. it is <laughs> and my colleagues that I care about deeply know how hard it is and we commiserate, uh, Sarah, you know how hard it is. And so it's, um, it's really, I, I just, I don't bother with that anymore. And also I fall back on, a book that really inspired me. And I thought, you know what? You can combine thrillers and sex. And the book that did that for me was Eye of the Needle by Ken Follett. Mm -hmm. That was one of the sexiest books because you talk about forbidden and you talk about the isolation, which I always try to um, build. You, you said you bring your character into a community and form a community around that character. It's very insightful of, of you um, because I do try to create a world where the rest of the world is kind of just disappeared it, it's it's that world and the characters it's a microcosm they have good people bad people um but their lives are are really uninfluenced 
by much that's going on. It's it's within that tight community that they're orbiting. And so when I read Eye of the Needle, I thought, here they are. It's got all the elements I loved. They're alone on this island they, that nobody knows where, you know, the communication is gone. The weather is prohibitive. They're, they're forbidden to each other. And yet that <laughs> allure, you know, just that allure. <laughs> and of course, he's a an assassin. He's a horrible person. But the love We're for thing it. is just, <laughs> you know, it's just great. And so I've got now, if somebody like Ken Follett can do this, <laughs> then what if you, what if you did, can right? do this? And um, and so that that book um, really influenced me a lot in terms of you can mix you can mix the two, and it has to be you know integrated into the story. And when people are running for their lives, it's a little bit impractical and implausible to think, oh, time out, we've got to have sex, you know. So it has <laughs> we have a be- name for that, Sandra, the danger bang, but. <laughs> I never had that term before. You're welcome. (laughs) It's yours now. Here's the the thing. uh, And I've done, you know, questionnaires and things on this before and asked, did you realize you were creating a a genre, helping create a genre? No, no, it was it was a subconscious thing. and, And I'm given far more credit than I deserve because I read um, Helen McGinnis. I read Evelyn Anthony. I read all of these writers, again, mostly British, who were writing basically uh, books during the Cold War. It was after World War II, but still that that influence, uh, you know, the Nazis, the spies, the all of that, and and they had wonderful, sexy books, especially. Uh, Evelyn Anthony was a big influence on me. Her books were amazing. And um, and the tension, because here again, the forbidden. Um, and so I, um, I really get uh, more credit than I deserve because I felt like I borrowed, you know, so much from from them, from other writers and from my contemporaries. So I think there were several of us who saw Hey, we have romance roots, but we still love the mystery. We still love the suspense. We still love wartime books or we still love, you know, spy novels. And so the way I felt about it was that the attraction heightens both elements of the story because you're never more afraid than when someone you care about is in danger even more than yourself. So it heightens that suspense. It heightens, let please don't let anything happen. And it heightens the urgency. If this is going to be the only time we have, then we're going to make the most of it. So it heightens both elements. It heightens the, the, um, the relationship and it heightens the danger because they work against each other with each other. As you're talking about this community of these other writers who were doing it at the same time as you, because there were, it, it felt like something broke, um, meaning the time, uh, you know, the tide broke and suddenly there was romantic suspense kind of everywhere in the genre. Did you have a community of other writers who were doing the same thing? Who were the members of that community? Well, I have to say, I have to give credit to international thriller writers Um, I was asked very early on, uh, Gail Lenz asked me, uh, and David Morrell, who I I didn't know at the time, um, Lee Child, some of these were saying, would you like to become part of this? We're going to form a, a, you know, league (laughs) of writers called International Thriller Writers. And we're breaking barriers. They did. I mean, it was like we want it to incorporate mystery. We want it to incorporate suspense. It can incorporate fantasy. It can incorporate romance. But every book 
should be a thriller. No matter what book you're writing, it should thrill your readers. So they were very democratic, you know, in, in this, this organization. And I think they possibly as much, if not more, went out of their way to include writers from another genre that wasn't so steeped in, um, you know, espionage or so, you know, mm-hmm. which we mm-hmm. call the mind thriller. They had horror writers. They had, you know, it was, it was everybody. And, um, and so I really have to credit that organization a lot with, with bringing everybody in and recognizing the contribution that women writers had made to the marketplace. Right. And, and they yeah. were, they were really a fundamental um, group that, that brought to the publisher's attention. Hey, we got all these great writers over here and guess what? You know, they're women. <laughs> what <a> concept. <laughs> <laughs> when you look back on your career, like, is it is there a book that you can point to where you thought, oh, I f- I'm feeling my direction change and I'm yeah. moving okay. away from straight romance? Or was it just really like a smooth continuum for you? There's not like a slow heat in heaven was the one or whatever. Yeah, well, it was slow heat in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's the one we hear about all the all time. The, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the book you hear about when somebody says Sandra Brown. It was, you know. uh, if you're it not us, kind of going a, another dawn, tomorrow's promise. <laughs> it was <laughs> kind Texas of Chase. a breakthrough um, for me, but um, apparently for a lot of romance readers, you know, it was like, what happened to that nice girl we used to know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was so gritty. Oh, right? I can still remember where I was when I read. <laughs> And I was in my Me sister's too. apartment in Waltham, Massachusetts, oh sleeping on an air mattress. Uh, and there I was. I've been to yeah. Waltham, Massachusetts. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, I remember um, I had finished the Texas trilogy, Lucky, Chase, and Sage. Who were the most, they were the most fun books I'd ever written. And they oh, are delightful. in their 45th printing domestically. Um and so they have resonated with a lot of readers and I loved those characters and they were so much fun. And I think I only wrote one other love swept uh, after that. And then I had signed a contract with, um, uh, it was Warner books um, at the time. And um they, I, I had kind of gotten to where I was like, you know, I've got to stretch. I've got to do, I, I had written like 45 romances mm-hmm. and I thought I really want to kind of get past these boundaries that, you know, now anything goes, but back then it was like, you know, you can't do this. You can't do gunplay. You can't, you know, language had to be controlled and there were certain plots. I was, as I said, always giving my editors heart attacks because they were going, "Ah, Sandra. And, you know, one of the characters in Texas trilogy, the plot, (laughs) she was married. And when I told my editor, I was going to do that. Well, when I told my editor, who's Carolyn Nichols. And when I told her, I said, I want to do these books from the male point of view. And she said, well, you can't do that. And I said, well, you kind of can. <laughs> I can. Let, let me show and you. I said, they're, you. they're thinking such wonderful old things. I think this would be, and I want to make them longer. And I will throw in a third book. I'll give you a, a woman point of view. I'll give them a bratty younger sister. And so that's where that came about. And that's so fascinating. I mean, that changed the game. I had to fight for that. And when I told her that the heroine, you know, in Lucky was going to be married, she said, your readers will never forgive you if you use, a, if you have an adulterous, you know, and I go, Carolyn, <laughs> how many books have I written for you? Yeah. <laughs> You're just going to have to get, go out on a leap of faith on this. 
And um, so, you know, made it that way. But when I, after I finished all those romances, I thought I, I want to do something where I don't have any kind of parameter I'm having to stay within. I, no borders, no fences. So I signed this book with uh, this deal with Warner to write a standalone novel. And it was Slow Heat in Heaven, what became Slow Heat in Heaven. And from the get go, I loved Cash Free Bro. And I said, same, this, obviously. <laughs> I said, this is going to be the Sandra Brown hero. It's the one that needs redeeming. <laughs> and did you know in the moment, were you like, oh, I knew I was writing the book? The minute he, the minute he showed up with that hoe across his um, shoulders <laughs> and his yes, hands, yes. And, <laughs> and his hands relaxed. <laughs> and then he kills the snake. And I thought, this is the Sandra Brown hero. And it's the one that, you know, needs love, that needs to be loved, that's hardened by life and needs Poor to be Poor baby. Yeah. Poor baby. Also, someone else kills a snake. Sa- Satcher kills say. a snake, too. In- so you're... <laughs> You're going back to your roots. You might not know, but we do. <laughs> we're 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 paying close attention here. <laughs> but I uh, I thought it, the minute he walked on the page, and and a lot of people, you know, it it, it took them so aback. You know, and the sexuality was a whole lot more graphic and everything. Mm-hmm. But I remember you had Susan Elizabeth Phillips on. Yes, mm-hmm. and I definitely remember a. Uh, it, I guess it was Romance Writers of America, some writers conference where she and I were, were both attending. And I think that's the first time I met her. I think it was, maybe not. But anyway, we were both there and we were very friendly. Love her, still love her, starling lady. And, um, and she was making a speech at lunch. She was like the keynote speaker. And she was going on about, she said, we as writers have to be fearless. We have to be fearless. We can't be um, inhibited by our own, you know, uh, timidity. And uh, that was her point. You know, be fearless. And she said, I have a post-it note on my computer screen. Be fearless. You know, take the chance. And she said, Sandra Brown. <laughs> like, she called you out. Yep. You got a strawberry shortcake dessert. You know? <laughs> and uh, she said, she shocked us all with slow heat in heaven. And she said, romance readers all over the country were saying, oh, how dare she? And she said they couldn't get enough of it. <laughs> How dare she? Can I have some more? Yeah. And so she said, and and it was, it was kind of a, it was definitely a turning point in my career, but it was also a book that, as you both have mentioned, um, kind of put readers back on their heels and went, what? I didn't know you could do this. You know, it felt and different. I it mean, did. it, it yeah. was different. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting because you brought up the Texas trilogy. And I feel like in Texas Chase, which we've done a deep, we did a deep dive episode on. So we recently read it and thought about it. You were moving into romantic suspense there too. There's a whole stalker Mm -hmm. thread line through that book. And, and it's, it's clear that that was the path you were on even before. I I, I never felt like I deserted, um, the romance genre. I felt like I learned so much from writing the romances. First of all, when they were, uh, when your page count was dictated, um, you know, you had to be, I had to learn to get into the, the action immediately, join the scene in progress. Um, And that didn't come with the first several books. I spent a lot of time, you know, tiptoeing through the tulips and describing everything and showing off to the reader how much research I'd done about a place. That they, and really what they wanted to know was, when are they going to meet? What, you know, what's going on? Right. So all <laughs> when are they going to kiss? You know, I was learning as it I feels very did, real. <laughs> and I got better at it. But little tools like that that I had to learn when writing romance. Um, 
I brought with me. I don't feel like I deserted anything. And as you say, the books always had shadings. I remember even my fourth book, A Treasure Worth Seeking, was about uh, uh, an FBI agent having to move into the heroine's apartment because her brother is escaped jail or something like that. And they're kind of hiding out, hoping he's going to show up. So there was always that that thread you mm-hmm. know, in there. Always an edge. Yeah. So you it, you moved to Warner to publish Slow Heat in Heaven. And so I guess my question is, did you move to Warner because you knew Warner would let you do something that maybe romance wouldn't let you do? My agent kind of threw the uh, the, the idea out there and, and they were the first to, you know, to really bite. And I, I think I did a three book contract and um, my first one. And the first two books, Slow Heat and um, Best Kept Secret, had Best Kept Secrets had a terrible cover on it. And uh, <laughs> we had a meeting, <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Okay." Um, and and what they had suggested is that if I was going to establish myself as a you know more suspense, more mystery, then perhaps I would rethink writing category romances. And that was a tough, that was a, it was, uh, that was tough to leave that safety net. Then it was, you know, on the high trapeze without one. And I couldn't, you know, I I had to make up my mind and I thought, yeah, this is where I want to go. So that was a career decision. So we had this meeting and it, it, it was so, it looked like a historical uh, recycle a cover that had been recycled from historical because you've got the heroin line back with the bosoms falling out and the, <laughs> the, 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 you know, the shirtless hero with the biceps and everything and so and I said this is a set on a horse training ranch <laughs> <laughs> What is this? I haven't seen anybody in West Texas who dresses like this. <laughs> and so I said, no more bosoms and biceps. I said, if if you're going to ask me to kind of start edging away from the romance elements into more mystery and suspense, then you've got to give me covers that yes. also indicate you that. have to help me succeed. Yeah. That's exactly right. And so on Mirror Image, they did a completely different type of cover. And guess what? It was my first book on the New York Times bestseller list. So I made my point. And from then on, I didn't have to, you know, you uh, fight for it. I had a little bit more pull. <laughs> <laughs> was there any discussion of changing your name? No, no, no. I wanted to publish under Sandra Brown. Yeah, that's great. Um, you hear other people having to, you know, make that switch. It still is a thing that people say in romance. You know, well, if you want to write something else, you need to change your name. I'm you just going to tell anybody. No, it's Sandra. Sandra Brown. Sandra didn't. Brown didn't, didn't either. You shouldn't have to either. <laughs> and that's also my real name. <laughs> that helps too. So let's talk about Sandra Brown, because we've already talked about, you know, what makes a Sandra Brown romance a little bit. But what do you think kind of is the hallmark of a Sandra Brown romance? What do you think saying to readers? Well, I uh, I don't know about saying to readers, but I had a I worked this out over time. I have four elements to me that are critical in, in every book, and I've carried it over into the suspense novels, but the romance aspect of that. The first one is that the hero and the heroine must be codependent to solve their problem. In other words, they share a problem that each has to try and overcome. They're coming at it from different angles. And unwillingly, they have to work together in order to solve it. That's the first thing. So build in, if I can, a problem they're going to share and they, they're they dependent on each other, not liking it at first, but that's the way it is. The second thing is they've got to share space. 
And this is the hardest thing to do because you've got to keep them together. And, um, and that, that, you know, all of the peripheral characters in Blind Tiger were a lot of people, but I tried as much as possible, even though Thatcher and Laurel were not living with each other, he kept showing up. <laughs> he was always showing up. I love it. And, I love it. Uh, and so I, I kept them together as much as possible. But in a romance novel, I think it's almost essential that they're on every page together. The desire is a given. It's going to be chemistry from the get-go. First time they see each other, sparks are going to fly, even though they don't demonstrate it. Sparks can fly in anger, spark, but there's going to be that static electricity, you know, automatically. So that's a given. And then the one that we've touched on in this, I think, is as important as any, if not the, it can't be easy. They've got to be forbidden for one reason or another. So you've got then a problem they've got to solve together. You've got them to share space. They're going to have the desire, but they can't give in to it. <laughs> so I was say, this, this explains it, everything right? about the kind of romance reader. I mean, it's just hardwired right into my system. Because <laughs> I say that a lot. A thing I struggle with, I think, in modern romance is they aren't trying to solve the same problem. They have separate problems. Mm. And I'm always like, okay, but... I don't care. <laughs> what are they doing together? <laughs> and I know that makes me old fashioned maybe, but I don't care. Solve a problem together. That's what I want to see you do. I think old fashioned works if it, you know, if it, um, if it's written correctly, um, it, a, a contemporary book by a contemporary writer and, and I read them and I love them, eat them up. Um, and I, as I said, the human emotions have not changed <laughs> so um you know we can we can go back and we can read you know his books written hundreds of years ago at dickens shakespeare you know it, it, wilkie collins anybody and those those emotions are still there identify i would love to hear one of the questions we sent you, and and I think is so important for these these interviews and for women in general in publishing, is when did you know you were Sandra Brown, right? When did you know you were a big deal? <laughs> you know, but was there a moment when you were like, oh, no, I'm a thing. I'm leaving a mark. I, I can't wait for that day. <laughs> 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 because I still feel, uh, I mean, uh, very much a yeoman. I mean, I am, I work <laughs> Hard. And um, and every day when I come to this computer, it's it's like I've never done it before. I start from scratch every day, and so um, I don't I don't think of Sandra Brown as Sandra. And in fact, my friends have heard me say before. My family has heard me say frequently, "I've got to go be Sandra Brown today." Uh, right. because a separate entity it, sure. it's like you know I don't fluff up every day <laughs> and um, and so it's it's like I still consider myself uh, you know just a someone who works very very hard and has been blessed with the opportunities that I have been given and um and to be able to do what I love doing and, and make a living at it. And I know that a lot of people, you know, just hate their jobs, but they're necessary. And I get to do what I love doing and, and get to have a job out of it. So I'm grateful every day. And I never, um, I think the, you know, it, it's really bad for a writer to start reading the press releases because <laughs> when you start getting complaints <laughs> yeah. that, about, you know, what you are, you, you can get really lazy. And so I face, um, I, I, I'm very paranoid and very fearful that whatever talent, and I don't even like to use that word, um, but I guess that's the word that has to suffice, but whatever storytelling ability um, that I may have, had our forming a sentence or creating a character um, yesterday will have left me last night. 
And so, <laughs> you know, I live in the fear of, of being exposed as the biggest fraud that ever pulled off, you know, a hoax. <laughs> that just sounds like you're a writer. Yeah. <laughs> this is all very comforting for me. Yeah. <laughs> but I think we can, we, Jen and I will, will say, we will oh. say you are obviously a legend to us. Well, and to many thank you. Friends. Thank you. That means a great deal. And I, I love to, um, to hear other, I mean, you know, I'm buddies with a lot of other writers and it, it's, uh, some are, are, you know, very, um, fearful the same way I am. Some are very, you know, laid back. Some think, you know, gosh, you know, in this fun. And I remember being, um, it, it, it was actually, at George and Barbara Bush's home in Houston for a luncheon uh, it, for one of her the foundation's uh, literacy programs. And Harlan Coven and I were there and we had our spouses with us. It was a lovely lunch. And so we were, we were outside in their garden having our picture made with them and everything. And he, you know, he's very, very tall. And um, he leaned down and he said, do you believe we get to do this? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know, I, I pinch myself all the time. I mean, the, telling my stories, writing my stories um, has enabled me to do amazing things, meet sports stars and movie stars and rock stars and um, and go on two USO tours, an opportunity that would not have been afforded me That's had amazing. I not been you know, a writer. Um, and so I'm, I'm forever grateful, but yeah, I don't look at, you know, Sandra Brown, the mom is just mom, believe me. Sandra Brown, the grandmother is just that, you know, uh, and, and Sandra Brown, the one that goes to work every day is the different one that shows up to make a speech. (laughs) (laughs) So as we wrap up though, one question that's, that I think it's just like a reflective question and you've seen this in advance is um, when you think about your body of work, especially like romance since this is a romance podcast, although you're welcome to talk about any one of your books, do you have a favorite? Do you have a book that you are especially proud of or that you hope will outlive you? Uh, well, I, I make a, when I'm asked this in a public uh, speech, public arena, I always say my favorite is the one that you're about to buy. (laughs) (laughs) Good answer. Great answer. But let's say you're asked for posterity. (laughs) No, um, I think if, uh, if I had to, well, of course, and this is not, I'm not being facetious on this. I was very proud of Blind Tiger uh, because it was a, it was a different kind of book and, and I hope it has long legs. I hope it, you know, lasts for a long time. I hope the word of mouth will spread because it is a different kind of story and it's kind of a yarn, you know, in a way. And, um, and I, I, I want people to read it. I thought there was some very interesting, um, character development in it and social, um, implications in it. And, uh, so I'm proud of it. Um, a book that comes around a lot is Envy. Um, people, uh, there's a lot of, um, fan base that, that say envy, you know, was, was one, uh, that I really loved. And so I think it might, it might live a, a longer time. And I think the trilogy will just because they're so much fun and they're still not an ebook. I can't get them uh, an ebook, and um, because of oh yeah, because we had to order. I had to like order paperbacks we had to read them when in we print. did this. Yeah, right. Wait, why can't they be an ebook? Well, it's <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's all contractual stuff, mm. uh, and uh, I hate that side of it uh, because you know. Yeah. Well, I could comment more, but I'm, I'm not. sure. But the the. It's uh, fine. You can come again when you're as ready. Soon, let's put it this way. As soon as it becomes feasible, uh, I, I would love to have them available to readers in ebook. Yeah. And, and they, I love people that read them, you know, the, in the whole volume, the one volume, because then they can read it like one 
read you know, it like one book. Page right. book. Yeah. I love, I mean, this is such a tiny, tiny thing, but that exclamation point really <laughs> does a whole lot of work on this oh, cover. And you know what? I heard you comment on that. Uh, on <laughs> oh, did you hear me call them sexclamation points? <laughs> <laughs> We're teaching you all the good stuff. And I may be, I may be wrong, but I think you attributed that to the publisher. And that was me um, because well. I, I thought when I, I, I can't just say Texas trilogy because that doesn't say anything. And so I thought, what if I put an exclamation point? <laughs> and, and I did. And so when I sent the manuscript it's in, perfect. It is. Uh, I said, now the exclamation point, it's, it's part of the title and it's going to be on all of the books. So yeah, it, that was my idea. We're going to put, I'm going to put a special beginning on the text, that episode to make sure that we get this correct. Cause I, I get it right. To correct the record, but it's a, those exclamation points are glorious and I love them very much. Oh, thank you. So this is sort of a separate question that I, I would love for you to answer, but is there anybody lesser known in romance who from, you know, who you think as we're Jen and I are, planning to interview, you know, as many people as we can over the next few years for this kind of a conversation? Or is there anybody who you absolutely think we have to talk to? And not just authors, but... I don't know who you have lined up. I think um, the contemporaries of mine that I mentioned before, I think Jane Ann Krentz, uh, yeah. because she writes mm -hmm. multi-genre and she does them all extremely well. Nora Roberts... Uh, well, wow. of course, we'd love to get Nora Roberts, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and and um, uh, Candice Camp, uh, because she has written contemporaries and historicals and she's been around more than 40 years um, and still turning out great books. And so she would be one I would suggest because they they do have that history. You know, they do have that longevity. And, uh, and, and recently, not too recently, but someone asked me, what, what are you most proud of? Um, you know, and it can't be your children and it can't be your long marriage and it can't be anything easy like that. But from a writing standpoint, from your, what, what's the thing you're most proud of? And I said, my longevity. It, it's not easy to uh, maintain. And I respect authors like you know like the dean Kuntzes and the stephen kings and and they were all they had all just started you know when just years a few years ahead of me and i read their works as inspiration when i first started out and um and dean Kuntz is a great plotter i mean he just and he wrote a book on how to write fiction and it became a bible early on um so all of these writers who year after year and decade after decade are still on the bestseller list. I mean, that, that speaks well of not, not just their talent, but their work ethic. Well, I also think it's nice as a, as a genre reader to see people I deeply respect becoming more widely respected. I mean, when I was younger, Stephen King was just a horror writer, but now Stephen King right. is Stephen King. Yeah. yeah, And I think that there's a way in which um, I, I appreciate deeply this, the idea that like great storytelling, it should, and great writing is, isn't just found in literary fiction, right? It's found in thrillers and horror and romance. And I think that that's one of the things that's so nice about seeing those people on those lists and seeing that longevity is there's readers now who read Sandra Brown that wouldn't read, you know, Demon Rum. And that's too bad, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're exactly right. And uh, and so I think there is, a, sometimes there is a, a uh, prejudice there, you know, but... Um, it, it 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 speaks well of a storyteller who can come up with that many stories and and over a period of decades. I mean, just decades and and remain a a uh, marketable you know commodity to to publishing houses. And so I I'm I'm proud of that longevity and it's work. I mean, it's just work and it speaks not just to you don't know, sit and wait to get inspired. You really have to 
put your butt in the chair, you know, and get your head out of the clouds and put words on paper. That's the only way I know how to do it. Uh, there's no other way that I know <laughs> to write a book except one word at a time. And um, I had another brilliant thought. Now it's left me. But um, uh, back to the, you know, the longevity and just working at it, just working at it. And um, I never aspired to do anything except entertain. I don't care if if uh, I win prizes, but my books are collecting dust, you know, on somebody's bookshelf. Um, I want to be the book they take to the beach, into the bathtub, uh, <laughs> you know, to bed with them at night. That have the coffee stain, the Coca Cola stain, the suntan oil. Um, you know, they're they're afraid from taking on the subway because you know that's the one you you don't want to put down. That's the one you're carrying around with you, and that's the one that's keeping you engrossed. And so, if I entertain. Um, my reader, then I can go to sleep at night that I've done my job for the day. That's, that's the one thing that I always set out to do is entertain my reader, tell the reader a story. Well, you have done that's it very well. For us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for so many years of fabulous Fabulous. Well, thank you. Y'all are so sweet. I, I feel very honored. Well, on a personal level, like, thank you for inspiring I mean, you are the re- you are the reason I write romance. So it is a huge honor to talk to you, oh, and well, it is we just honor. learned that we have um, you have imprinted on our on our reading. I was trying to be real cool, but when you described you meeting Candace Camp, that was me meeting you. It's fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sandra, this was an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Man, when that was over, I was like, that's why that's Sandra Brown. That's why she's Sandra Brown. She was the best. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like not even really making words. I'm surprised I did when we talked to her because I don't think people realize like this was such a formative author. We were really, I mean, I think longtime listeners of us will not be surprised to hear that we were very stressed out. (laughs) about doing this right <laughs> y'all we prepared we prepared so like, hard almost too it. much I was a little worried by how much we prepared yeah I was like uh-oh <laughs> what if we lose our mojo but um it was so great I loved her I loved just how she I loved her her wisdom I loved that when she when we asked her about the hallmarks of a Sandra Brown novel she, she had a list she knew exactly what she wanted what she was and she knew exactly how Sandra Brown novels feel and I mean the second she said, and they're pretty fearless, I was like, that's it. That's the whole ball game." And we've talked so much about that over the last three years. Not just about her, but about all the books that we've loved. Yes. Um, just that there's this sense of fearlessness in them. And so it just reminded me that as writers, our work is to swing for the fences. And maybe we clear them and maybe we don't, but you swing. We're going to talk a lot this year about... Uh, like the history of romance. And, you know, The Flame and the Flower was this, like, really important kind of marker. Um, I, I, but there's, you know, romance existed before in a lot of different iterations in a lot of different ways, but, you know, sort of genre romance. And the thing that I have been thinking a lot about is um, who the romance reader you are is really formed by your primordial romance texts. And when Sandra Brown talked about what made, uh, what makes a Sandra Brown romance, it was so, <laughs> it was like, this is what is romance is to me. Yeah, it's like she unpeeled you right. straight to your core. It's right there. She made me who I was. <laughs> but I think the other thing that's really interesting is, is that can be true at the same time that I can see how romance has really changed. Yeah. And so that's the part that I, I think continues to astound me is um, outsiders to romance are kind of like, aren't they all books all the same? And I was like, no, yes and no, right? Like, Mm -hmm. yes, there's something it delivers to me every time. And hearing Sandra Brown verbalize what she wants to do in her books really made that clear to me. But also so much has changed. 
Yeah. Well, it was interesting because reading Blind Tiger, which is probably 60% mystery slash thriller, 40% romance, really gave me a feel for – there were so many moments where I thought, oh, that's Sandra Brown. That's yes. San- like This feels – it's – it's a lesson in authorial voice reading that book, Mm -hmm. you know, 30 years after I read my first Sandra Brown novel. Um, And I, because I, I can still hear her in it. And then after meeting her, you sort of have this moment where you're like, oh, it all connects in this really cool way. Um, But also it, it feels like the romance there is a Sandra Brown romance, not a romance of an author who just started this year. And that is also very cool. I think the work of what what we have talked about, we want us wanting this season to be, feels like um, we're really in that first interview. It just felt like, okay, we're starting to see already the long road. And I'm really excited about that. I think one other thing I've been thinking a lot about is, um, I think I mentioned a couple times here and there, I, there's a podcast I really enjoy listening to with my husband called Hit Parade which is about pop music. And it talks about, like, sort of opens with, like, we're going to talk about, like, you know, disco and Donna Summer, but then it traces back, right, all of the people that sort of influenced that music. And then there's sort of a part where it's like, who has Donna Summer influenced, right? That's a really good episode, everybody, by the way. Um, But one of the things I was thinking about as we talked to Sandra Brown was Tia Williams. So we interviewed Mm -hmm. Tia Williams about her book, Seven Days in June. um, Last season. Last season. But Tia Williams talked about her love of Slow Heat in Heaven and Sandra Brown. And when I thought about it, it made perfect sense because I could see sort of um, the influence. And I think that's the part about knowing, I mean, you know, my brain's got to be good for something, I guess, is it is really fascinating. We talk about like the romance family tree and sort of how, who influences who. I think that's another thing we are hoping that these Trailblazer episodes can do is really show you the people who, um, you know, these things are all connected. Every romance has that common DNA, but some people tune in more to some authors than others. And it's really, that was another fascinating thing for me. What's remarkable to me is how all of these people that we've talked to have been able to name other authors who inspired them, pushed them, kept them moving, you know, helped them in the early days of their career. And I think that is when, as I, as I think about this piece of it, I keep coming back to this heroine's journey question that we've talked about so much when we're talking about the actual books, but Um, the heroine's journey is really the journey of a lot of these writers too. Um, just finding community, writing romance, romance in general, writing is such a lonely road. Um, but I don't think any of us in romance or out of it get anywhere without a community. And so it's really wonderful to hear those names spoken. Yes. Yeah. So I hope everyone enjoyed this conversation as much as we did. (laughs) It was the best. (laughs) There are some, we have a lot of awesome things teed up for you. We have written some, talk about swinging for the fences. If you even knew the emails we've been sending to people. (laughs) (laughs) We're not clearing all the fences, but we sure are trying. We're trying. Um, (laughs) And you know what? I think the other thing that I will try and do in show notes is... Um, maybe put some of our favorites of these authors, right? So they're talking, we've asked about their favorites, books that they loved, but um, so show notes, I hope, will be um, something else. (laughs) That's right. I did just have a moment where I was like, should we read Slow Heat in Heaven? I mean, we read the Texas book, but... I did. You know what? I did when we read that book. Did you reread it when we did that? That's one I reread when we did Sand Brown. So I will make sure we um, link to that episode as well for all of that's right. Oh, also, how cool was it that she clearly listened to our Sandra Brown episode? I don't even want to talk about it. It was amazing. It was amazing. She had like, she had like prepped information about our yeah. favorite books. And honest to God, like what a class act. Yeah. She was a Sandra like, Brown. We love you're you. the best. <laughs> Thank you so much. Come back anytime. <laughs> um, and that's that. You've been listening to Faded Mates. I'm Sarah McLean. I'm Jennifer Prokop. You can find us on Instagram at Faded Mates Pod, on Twitter at Faded Mates, and in your ear holes every week. Every week at FadedMates.net or on your favorite podcatcher. 
Uh, you can like and follow us on your favorite podcatcher and you won't miss a single episode. We've got a lot cooking for season four. Also at fadedmates.net, you can buy merch and stickers from best friend Kelly and uh, Jordan Denae. There's also, ooh, you guys, for season four, there's a Fade Meets tote bag now and a Fade Meets mug. So there you go. Don't say we never do anything for you. <laughs> Have a great week. We hope you're reading something great. Next week is an interstitial week. Uh, we haven't talked about the trope yet. We'll, we're going to do that now. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out, everybody. <laughs> we prep for Sandra Brown and not for next week. So on brand, as always. We'll be there. <laughs> <laughs>